Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this course. Uh, just as, the, as a way of reminder, uh, here I show you to begin with uh, just the, the, the summary of the course, just to, to go very quickly through the things that we discussed yesterday. We had uh, an introduction to this classical evolutionary theory. I, I was a bit uh, so uh, thought provoking regarding the phylogeny and, the, and its meaning and uh, how these trees are reconstructed and what they mean regarding organisms and uh, how at the level of uh, small, so fast mutating organisms and especially viruses and also molecular evolution, uh, there was this uh, dominance of uh, horizontal gene transfer. And uh, so as, as a really powerful uh, evolutionary and adaptive mechanism, we saw other evolutionary mechanisms. And um, at the end of the day, we started uh, so a, a very brief introduction about genotype networks. This will be the topic of uh, today's lesson. And I uh, will be talking about RNA as a model for molecular evolution. We saw a few uh, an introductory, so, so few introductory ideas about genotype networks and uh, the uh, idea of, of uh, not losing meaning when you evolve. That uh, so I used this uh, metaphor of uh, words in English, and uh, that was uh, used by Minner Smith. First introduced by Minner Smith uh, some 50 years ago, right? So. Uh, this is what we saw yesterday. One of our questions, uh, of our last questions, was whether function percolates the space of sequences. So this is important because this means that I can navigate the space of meaning, the space of functional uh, meaning, uh, without. So, but this should give me access to different phenotypes, and I should not lose the function that I'm currently performing. And I'm talking from the viewpoint of a molecule, of course. Right. So we saw this contraposition of ideas, uh, this uh, assumption maybe that there was one gene mapping into one function and that then every, that every molecular function perhaps, uh, or it was thought by some, uh, it was uh, restricted to a specific sequence. And of course, this was a major problem to guarantee evolution by natural selection, right? This was... Uh, uh, what Salisbury proposed, and then then, then came Maynard Smith again, suggesting this was just a proposal. So there was no evidence of the existence of these networks. This was something that was demonstrated uh, several years later, starting at the end of the 80s, so at least 20 years later, starting with RNA. And uh, so uh, the, the so his proposal was yes, but if you have to navigate this space of sequences, this space of meaning, then you should have some sort of continuous networks that allow you to access uh, different um, different phenotypes. Not only that, but also to uh, to have partial adaptation that can be later refined. Right. So not everything starts at once as a fully formed functional uh, protein in this case, but can have a pathway of improvement uh, starting somewhere in, in some arbitrary places of sequence spaces. This is what we are going to, to see today. Um, so we will start by asking ourselves, how does the genotype phenotype map structure sequence spaces? So how are, what is the topology of these uh, genotype networks and who, in, in which ways do they fragment the space of um, of sequences, right? So this is the, the, the general picture that we have. So a genotype network in the case of proteins, for instance, would be all sequences that map onto the same sequence of amino acids. In the case of proteins, um, if we are strict with this definition of genotype, I will, uh, excuse me, of phenotype, I will to, I, I want to remark that I will be, um, I will be using different definitions of phenotype. Also later, we will discuss that the properties, the global properties that we see for the, that we will see for these networks are not uh, dependent or not strongly dependent on the definition of phenotype, which is good because uh, of course, what we are looking for is for general properties of these spaces. And in this specific case, my phenotype, I will be defining it every time that I use a different phenotype, say, uh, in this example, my phenotype is the protein sequence, right? 
It could be the protein structure, but just to fix ideas, just imagine you have the protein sequence of amino acids. Then it's clear what is the kind of redundancy that you have in these proteins. It is the uh, positions that in the genetic code, when you change these positions, then you go to the same amino acid, right? This would form a genotype network where you would have two sequences linked if they differ in just one position, right? So this is a, a definition. And if you do like that, you can just map all possible sequences into all possible proteins, and you will have subsets of this space where um, that group that contain all the sequences that map onto the same protein. This is a genotype network. Sometimes these networks are fully connected. Sometimes they are not. Sometimes they are formed by independent uh, connected components of different sizes. And we will see also some instances of, of those cases, right? Every node, wherever I talk about every node is a genotype, a sequence specifically, and two nodes will be connected if the sequences they have as shown in this example, differ in only one letter. There might be other definitions, but I will stick to this one just to fix ideas and to uh, allow us to be quantitative about what we are going to see next. So when you do this, then your space is somehow fragmented. This is a, just an illustration. You will have here your uh, your networks, your genotype networks, mapping into a given phenotype, wherever the phenotype is, different phenotypes, different genotype networks. And of course, there are pathways, mutational pathways that allow you to go from one phenotype to another phenotype. In the case of uh, proteins, but especially in the case of RNA, this is very well defined. You have uh, many uh, ways in which one single mutations can map one phenotype onto another, right? Not all changes are possible just one with one mutation, but since those networks are typically very extended, so they are formed by a large number of sequences, depending on the sequence uh, where you are, the, the, the position where your population is in this huge network, we will see how big these networks are also, then you can jump to different phenotypes that might be just one step away, just one mutational move away, right? So this is the picture that we have. This is for the moment, it's not quantitative, it's just uh, qualitative. You divide your space of sequences, this could be the whole space, you divide it into two different phenotypes and these phenotypes are linked because there are connections, there are contacts between the networks of, of different phenotypes, right? Okay, um, so redundancy actually occurs not only at the level of sequence to, uh, in, in the case of proteins of sequence to, to amino acids, but also at many other levels. I have a question, yes, Pratyush? Yes, I wanted to ask about, uh, you spoke about RNA. So I uh, understand that at the level of the protein, when we have synonymous codons, then multiple sequences will code for the same protein. But I wanted to ask how uh, this redundancy comes in RNA. Uh, do we also, because the previous illustration seemed to suggest that for RNA, this redundancy exists, but I thought that sequence and uh, uh, like sequence mapping would be one to one in case of DNA to RNA. Uh, so is yeah, that I, case? I I I apologize if, if it was a bit confusing because uh, as I was saying, so a, a major assumption when we do these studies is that well, it's not an assumption; it's something that we have learned through practice that the specific map that you consider from genotype to phenotype is not very much affected in the, the emerging topological properties that you see for the networks. Having said that, when I uh, refer to the model, to simple models of sequence to proteins, usually I'm thinking of DNA, right? Or, well, or, or RNA, if you think of messenger RNA, whatever, right? So there is a one-to-one -one mapping from DNA to RNA, and then there is a degeneration from any of those maps to proteins, right? And uh, however, when I talk of RNA, my phenotype will be something different that I will define in a couple of slides, which is the secondary folded structure, right? It's not the sequence of amino acids, but my phenotype, I also said, I'll be using different definitions of phenotype. So in RNA will be the folded secondary structure, the minimum free energy specifically. 
Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I, and apologies for the confusion. Okay, so um, just to, 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 I always like to keep in mind the whole picture, right? We have to, to, to do specific research and to advance in some areas, we need to reduce the, the complexity of the, of the whole system, but redundancy can be there at many levels. So you can have your sequence, you can have synonymous mutations that lead to the same uh, not only structure, but of course also the same amino acid sequence. This is uh, the case that I was uh, emphasizing at the beginning with proteins. But you could have also changes in the sequence of amino acids that actually, for instance, do not change polarity of the amino acid or do not change basic uh, chemical properties. And then this leads to uh, structural changes that are not relevant for the function of the protein or that are not seen. So there is another level of redundancy also when you go to the structure and, and so above the sequence of amino acids. Again, this is something that I mentioned also yesterday, you can have, in, when you can see the whole organisms and you have networks of genes, you can eliminate even genes from these networks and you still have the organisms performing the function. Something that we have learned, and this is something that we studied a few years ago, was that the larger the number of levels, the higher the redundancy you have in biological systems. And th that's an important uh, point that uh, I think can explain also how biological systems are constructed through all these uh, layers and layers and layers of expression and complexity that you put on top. At the end of the day, what this brings to these systems is a higher resilience and higher resistance to mutations. They are not that sensitive uh, to what can happen at the microscopic level, which is good. At the same time, it gives plasticity because you have this redundancy that can be used to uh, support one loss in front of, of uh, say, an environmental um, change, for instance, right? So this is something that we know, but for today, we are only going to use one level uh, genotype to phenotype maps, which is the case of RNA, right? Now, what is going to be my genotype? What's going to be my phenotype? Genotype is easy, is the sequence of uh, RNA, an RNA sequence, right? And this is a, a DNA sequence, sorry about that. It's, uh, you know, I, 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 no, 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 this is RNA. Okay, that's RNA, it's not T there. Okay, this is RNA. And the, the phenotype that I will be focusing in is the folded secondary structure. So usually this using thermodynamical principles, you can fold these uh, sequences and you get um, the minimum energy folded state. When you form bound, bonds between uh, different positions in your sequence, you decrease the energy of the open strand and uh, uh, that you have also contributions from loops from unpaired nucleotides, but somehow you can uh, calculate this minimum state. That's a very complex problem, computationally speaking. You can solve it mostly for short sequences, but as sequences get longer, it's more difficult to solve. Anyway, we will assume that with the methods that have been developed by many different groups and uh, we've been using intensively uh, that developed by the Vienna group, uh, where Peter Stadler, Peter Schuster, and Manfred Eigen so began studying the properties of, of this RNA and the properties of networks. So they developed the Vienna RNA. This is a folding algorithm that is available online that you can use uh, to see what are the folded conformations. And you can get all sorts of information about these folded states. But the simplest model that we will be focusing in is you have a sequence, just using thermodynamics, minimizing energy, you get a folded state. There are different representations of the folded state. For instance, here we see the full structure and it's very clear where you have uh, loops, internal loops and uh, the end of your sequence, what are stacks, these are, these are uh, so small wobble loops and so on. And um, you can also have a representation as here below where you have parentheses and points, right? Parentheses are, uh, upstream and downstream form stacks, right? Close stacks, you have here the red part closest with the red part here, and this is a stack here, this one uh, between the three prime and five prime ends and the same in between, right? Uh, so this will be a hairpin loop 
because this is the terminal loop that is closed by a stack and so on. So these are two typical representations of secondary structures. And especially this one with parentheses and points allows us then to make uh, quantitative comparisons between structures, for instance, by calculating the differences in the, in the, the positions, in the symbols that you have at each position for two sequences. So what is the structure that this uh, genotype to phenotype map induces in the space of sequences? First of all, you sh we should know that there is an extremely huge redundancy in this map. I'm showing here uh, five examples of sequences that do fold into this same secondary structure here in uh, the one of the representations and here in parentheses and points representations. When you study for this specific structure, but for many others, the uh, distances between the sequences that fold into this structure, what you see very often is that the difference between two sequences is as large as it could be if you would be cho choosing two random sequences, meaning when you compare these sequences, th these might be related. I, I took them from a simulation, so there might be some uh, correlations in the sequences here. But uh, if you consider the whole of the network, the whole of the set of sequences that fold into the secondary structure, what you see is that if you pick two sequences in the network, they coincide in about 25% of their positions. If they can be then that far away as two random sequences are, this gives us a first idea that uh, indeed these networks might be percolating the space of sequences because you can go as far as you would go if you would randomly change positions. Still, there are correlations, I insist on that, but these networks are extremely extended in space. Right? So this is the first point. So how big is really this redundancy. Let's keep with the same secondary structure. We have constructed our networks. And uh, so the first thing is that there are um, analytical ways of estimating the, an upper bound. This is an upper bound for the number of different structures that you have in the space of sequences of a given length. Right. This is a this is a quantity that that can be calculated through a procedure that was developed by uh, Stein and Waterman. This was in a, a mathematical problem in recursion that was later used by, as I mentioned, this Vienna group, Schuster and co-workers, Peter Schuster and co-workers, and they applied it to the calculation of uh, of different uh, secondary structures of RNA. So given length n. This is an upper bound, this number S of n, that goes like, well, it's expression here exponentially with the length and with a correction uh, with this exponent in the denominator, right? So this is the an upper bound to the number of different structures that you can produce with sequences of length n. That's a very important result because actually, you know that for a given length, you can also, uh, calculate the number of different sequences, which is four to the n. So you just make the ratio between these two quantities. I have four to the n different sequences divided by the number of different structures, and I get an average. This quantity here, sorry, oh, 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 oh. spoiler. I get an average for the number of different sequences that fold into each secondary structure. Look at the number. This is 10 to the 11. This is the number of stars in the galaxy, the number of neurons in your brain. And this is only for sequences of length 35. So the size of these spaces is unfathomable. I mean, there are no ways in which you can be exhaustive about studying all possible secondary structures and all possible functions in consequence that can be present in these spaces. I mean. There are no computers sustaining that, but we also come back to one of uh, Salisbury arguments. There are no ways in which in the life of a universe, in the life of thousands universe, you can go through all possibilities in, in the different sequences that you have, right? So the, the, the problem, of course, becomes much worse if you go to longer sequences. So a, a sequence of length 1,000 is not that big for biological purposes. We have much longer sequences in biology. And this 
raises the amount of different sequences to 10 to the 600, right? So considering that the number of particles in the universe is about 10 to the 72. So you have so many orders of magnitudes above that, that it's absolutely certain first that you are never going to explore the whole space of sequences. But second, that the space of possibilities as you move in those spaces, you are essentially always discovering new possibilities. With every new mutation, your neighborhood is huge. And if you incorporate a couple or three of mutations, you are exposed to rich and diverse areas and different areas of your space of sequences that were not explored before, right? Yeah, Sharma. So I believe like there is some fixed phenotype in mind while computing these sizes of the structure, uh, the genotype uh, network. So are, are these also robust, these uh, estimates, if one changes the uh, whatever like protein or phenotype, which was fixed before computing these objects? Uh, you, you mean about the, the numbers that we get? Yeah. So we, if we change the definition of phenotype, you will have yeah. uh, some different numbers, right? Yes, yeah. that's true. But uh, I, it, it's just nuances on, on these huge spaces. Yeah, so the order remains more or less the same. Yeah, I mean, I just eliminate 100 orders of magnitude. I don't <laughs> mind. I mean, it's 10 to the 500. I mean, even 10 to the 50 is something that you cannot grasp in any way. Yeah. Okay. So even if you put these uh, other levels and you, you include other redundancy and you say, well, yeah, uh, so there are not that many different phenotypes. So still, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the numbers, yeah, are, are huge. It does not mean, and this is something that we can discuss later, that uh, so, of course, we do not have access to all genotypes. That's definitely true. It doesn't mean that we do not have access to all, say, sufficiently optimal phenotypes. Actually, this has to be so because uh, nature is working, right? Biology is working, is robust and has been there since it appeared continuously. So this means that the, the phenotypic diversity that we have, that we can access, even having access to a reduced fraction of the space of sequences, even in that case, should be enough to have a system working, Okay. right? Mm -hmm. oh, so that, that's, that's uh, I mean, we have the proof of concept. I mean, we are here, right? Yeah, yeah. We may not be optimal, but we're working enough <laughs> to, to continue reproducing somehow. Okay, so, but this does mean that these uh, networks are really huge. Average numbers here do not mean much because as, as I will show you later, there is uh, uh, many orders of magnitude difference between large phenotypes and small phenotypes. Right, this we will see. So the average is uh, well, just to give us, a, just to impress you somehow, is yes, to impress people that that these numbers are so huge, right? Okay. Uh, so this means indeed that these networks are very large. And since these networks are very large, we have this idea that I've been also entertaining uh, in previously about phenotypic accessibility. This meaning that uh, so that's a poor projection of this huge space in in two dimensions, but you move in one. A network of genotypes without losing your phenotype, and you can have access to many different uh, phenotypes. In the case of RNA, so you have one single mutation, for instance, and your fault has completely changed into a different secondary structure. You can do that, this transition, if you are sitting in this part of the green uh, network, but if you incorporate some mutations, your population moves, goes somewhere else, then uh, the, the phenotypes that I will have access to are different. So how different are those? What happens when we computationally, because it's more difficult to do it experimentally, move on those networks? So this is a, um, a computational example where uh, simulations were started where with this tRNA that you see here with this secondary structure and the specific sequence, right, for the secondary structure. And this is a neutral walk meaning that you incorporate mutations to the secondary structure, to the sequence of the secondary structure, as long as the secondary structure is not changing. This means you, we, are, we are moving, right, uh, on top of the neutral network of the secondary structure. 
These are the moves that you accept. This is the length of the neutral walk, right? See, uh, I mean, here you do a move and you accept or not accept it. But as you can see, this is uh, essentially a straight line, meaning that the fraction of moves that you accept is not changing as you progress along this neutral walk. So essentially, once you have incorporated about a thousand mutations, you're in the same situation that you were at the very beginning. You can still keep on incorporating mutations. So at the, at the, at the regular pace, right? Here in the vertical axis, what we see is the number of different secondary structures that you have in the neighborhood of the initial sequence. So you have with, we start, you start with the sequence here and you calculate if I make point mutations in this sequence and study all the mutants in this sequence, how many different structures, how many different secondary structures do I, do I have? And this is the number in the vertical axis. Then you accept one new mutation, you calculate again. You are accepting mutations and you are calculating how many different secondary structures, that's a cumulative number, you have visited through your neutral walk. So you start somewhere in the green network, calculate the neighborhood here. For instance, I have uh, this neighbor, which is a distance one. This is a structure that I can access. As I move, I find new structures that I can access. Again, two dimensions is too poor to capture all this uh, diversity. But at some point you reach a new structure, you see a new structure in the neighborhood and so on. And you, here you are accumulating the number of different neighbors that you see in your one mutant away neighborhood, right? And you see that the number of different secondary structures that you visit is again, so steadily increasing. What does this mean? This means that just by neutral drift, which is what we are forcing on the uh, network of this secondary structure, we are accessing many different phenotypes and we are continuously finding new phenotypes that uh, we can uh, jump to with uh, just one mutation, All right? So this is one of the powers of, of these very large networks because it allows you this exploration that Maynard Smith was suggesting and that we have very clearly seen in, in RNA as, as example. Yes, I have another question. Uh, I just had a small clarification. So on the y-axis, is this the number of unique secondary structures that we have seen so far, or uh, yes. can a structure be counted twice? Uh, no, here? it's a unique secondary structures. Okay. These are different secondary structures. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. So, so you see, it's it, it's huge the number of different structures I can access without changing my structure and, and in principle, my function. One could argue, well, okay, yes, you're changing point mutations, but there might be some sites which, uh, where you need to maintain the sequence, for instance, because uh, these are active sites and you cannot arbitrarily change, for instance, what's there here in this, in this loop. Okay, no problem. If you fix some parts of the sequence, and I have done this uh, research myself, still there is plenty of space uh, of, of a space of sequences available to keep on changing uh, parts of RNA that uh, only have a structural meaning, for instance, and no, are, are not interacting with other, so specifically in sequence, right? So you can also do this change of phenotype, sorry about that. Uh, so fix some sequences even, and you get the same picture. This is why I said that it doesn't depend that much on the definition of phenotype. You can constrain the definition of phenotype and still you get the same picture. Right. Uh, so, yeah. one mutation is to one secondary structure, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a different way of essentially representing what we just saw. And there is an additional information here, which is, um, these lines here represent uh, the distance in a structure to the, uh, to the original secondary structure, okay? I, I don't want to devote much time to that because I will come later with an example and you will understand what I mean by um, the, the, the difference between, so, so when, when I look at the one uh, mutant neighborhood, 
I study all positions, I change all positions in my sequence and study the structure of the neighbors, it might be that uh, these neighbors are, resemble very much my original structure or not that much. So I can calculate it by estimating the distance, the structural distance between my original structure and the neighbors of, the, of its sequence, of the representing sequence. And depending on the region of the network where I am sitting, this quantity varies. For RNA, what is true is that paired positions, positions in stacks, this is what I'm showing here in this plot, positions in stack do not have that much freedom to be changed. And positions in loops and paired nucleotides have a larger degree of freedom to be changed. Essentially, you have a two levels, mostly, where you have an average for how many neutral neighbors an unpaired position has and how many neutral neighbors a paired position has. Right? So you have much more freedom in uh, positions that are not paired. Right? So, and this will allow later calculation of the typical size of, of these uh, neutral networks. Yes, another question, Pratyush. Yeah, so uh, I, I was just thinking that here, when we're looking at one, uh, one change mutations, then uh, this seems very intuitive that the loops which are unpaired uh, should have uh, a higher degree of change compared to the ones which are paired. But if we look at two changes, then we can have complementary changes in the ones which are paired and still uh, retain structure, right? So uh, will this picture change a lot if we look at two uh, changes versus just one change? Uh, just yeah. curious uh, about well, that. Uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't change much. Probably these numbers would change, of course. But what you are changing is the mutational rules. So you are changing the definition of link, right? So I define it, the link in a way. I define it phenotype and genotype. And if you change the definition, you're getting a different network. So you will be navigating a different network if you allow compensatory mutations to occur simultaneously, right? Um, well, the topological properties again should not change. I need to focus ideas, so I will stick to this model, but uh, I know that the Vienna group, for instance, has considered uh, the simultaneous change of a pair has uh, considered that this is a single mutation. So if you change a GC by AU at once, uh, then they consider this to be a single mutation and uh, you essentially get the same results. So the, the same merging properties, the same behavior, same dynamical behavior, right? So no, it, it, it's not that different. Although yes, it's a point. Um, if you have point mutations, on the other hand, uh, which is what typically happens when you have replication, this situation should be, uh, if a point mutation has a probability P, the, the other situation has a probability P squared, and moreover, you have to fix the position. So it, it's difficult that uh, this process is, is common enough so as to overread the, the effects of point mutations. What happens, however, yes, is that uh, sometimes you have a mutation and you have other mutations that compensate for the effect of the mu this mutation that has changed somehow the secondary structure. You, you have all sorts of possibilities, that's true. Okay. So going back to one of the questions in the previous slide, uh, in a simulation of this uh, process where 80,000 random sequences were fault, only 20 structures occurred twice, giving you an idea that if you uh, randomly sample the space of sequences, it's very rare that you get the same sequence. But if you force your system to travel on the neutral network of a secondary structure, then you can find an astronomically large number of solutions to, the, to, to that uh, structure, right? This means that the space of phenotypes is highly intertwined, meaning that you have this proximity between uh, different uh, genotype networks. This is because they are so huge and so extended in space, but they are also very thin in a sense, very diluted. So you have them connected, but the local connectivity is very much below the maximum uh, connectivity number, which would be three times the length of my sequence, right? So the degree is not that uh, large locally, typically. 
So this, have, uh, th this means that uh, you have this possibility of find many, many phenotypes in a very small regions of genotype spaces, but their organization is not random. Right? It's not that uh, if you do this search at random, you're going to get the same results than if you do this search locally and with constraints. Okay, so these networks are heterogeneous. I was saying there is a way are very uh, close uh, to to the uh, to the well, to to the shape you are studying, right? So um, there is a degree difference degrees of what is called mutational robustness. This meaning, what's the tolerance to mutations of my sequence? Some sequences admit many changes, and the secondary structure is not changed. This is a high uh, mutational robustness, and some structures specifically those at the periphery, admit very few changes or just one, perhaps. Uh, otherwise, they change the secondary structure. These are very brittle. They have low mutational robustness. And this is also uh, captured through the humming distance to the non-neutral one neighborhood, again, as I was saying. So this can be calculated because you have sequences of the same length and the structures of the same length. If you use the notation of parentheses and points in the secondary structure, you can just calculate the number of different positions. And this is a humming distance between structures. You do the average of, your, uh, of the mutants in the one neighborhood, and then you can see specifically that you have in every network you have a gradation between uh, brittle uh, sequences, probably at this imaginary periphery, because it's a very high dimensional object, and mutational robustness at the core of this network. Right. So we know that in RNA, the stability of the full state and neutrality are positively correlated. Just give me a simple example of why this is so. Just imagine that you have many GC pairs. GC pairs are highly energetic in the sense that they lower very much the energy of the folded state. So they uh, convey a, a high stability to the folded uh, structure, right? And also if you have many GC pairs, for instance, just the case that you change your C by a U, this can be accepted and it's still forming a pair, not that stable, but since you have the rest of the structure, you can accept all these mutations without changing the secondary structure. So this means that you can accept more mutations, the more stable you are. So there is this positive correlation in RNA between this stability and the number of mutations that you can accept, therefore, between stability and neutrality of the folded state. Right? Yes, Tipa Agashi. Um, hi, I was just curious, this is a bit tangential probably to what you've been discussing, but I was curious whether on, on top of this uh, sort of single dimensional axis of fitness, which is the, the folding uh, of the RNA, is it possible to explore also for a few of these uh, bases, like in the example of tRNA, where the anti coron would have specific meaning if there are mutations there, or the, the stem loop, mm -hmm. or uh, basically a specific basis which very clearly unknown to have another axis on which fitness is going to be determined. Um, how do these kinds of results change or is that just very difficult to do? No, this we can, you, you can do. Of course, uh, as I was mentioning, you have to define your phenotype. You can do all sorts of uh, restrictions to your phenotype. One, in one of, of, of uh, a work we carried out uh, some years ago, we, um, uh, that we have also repeated, we had a, a fitness that was defined through three different variables. This was the number of pairs, um, the energy of the folded state, and a specific sequence that had to be maintained because uh, that mm -hmm. was an active site, right? Mm -hmm. So then your phenotype is defined through these three characteristics. And this, these are mandatory because they are necessary to fulfill the function, right? Function is always one step above that. So mm -hmm. if you use these phenotypes, you essentially get the same results. Huh. Okay. So topologically, you get the same results. So your networks might, might be some maybe smaller, some maybe larger. So yeah. you have a change of, of assignations of sequences to phenotypes, of course, right? right? So the mapping changes, but the right. topological properties do not. Uh, this is, again, uh, this is reflecting the huge size of the space of sequences. Mm. Mm. So mm. still, even if you put an, a number of constraints, there are many different solutions to your problems. Actually, one of the questions that I never addressed, but since you bring that 
uh, now uh, I think it, it is one can uh, uh, so think about that is how many constraints can I put right on right. a single sequence until I have just one single solution. Right. Yeah. That, I was about to ask that actually next. It's like, you know, can you keep raising the constraints? At what point does this topology break down effectively? Right. So then um, let me tell you something. We have done this exercise still with uh, a different model. With the, is, is, this is the HP model for protein folding. This is a model that occurs on a lattice and you have just two types of positions, hydrophobic or hydrophilic, right? And then you fold, your, your folds are just... Uh, so um, paths on, on a two-dimensional lattice, right? Mm -hmm. So if in this model you fix the boundary, so meaning the positions that interact with other um, structures, similar structures, mm -hmm. and the fold, then you have the case that you have one sequence, one, um, one phenotype, and there are no connections between phenotypes. And then mm. you wonder, okay, so then the system is not evolvable, right? Mm. Mm. In Salisbury sense, I cannot go from one phenotype to another because every time I do a mutation, I destroy my original phenotype. So I cannot keep the function. So there is a solution for that. And I was mentioning this in passing in one of the slides. You just need to add further layers of complexity. Mm. If instead mm. of working with two elements, you work with three and your aim is to break, say, for instance, a sequence or catalyze something, then you put these upper layers and then you recover through the, re through the redundancy of the higher levels, you recover your robustness. So even in that case, there is a solution that probably biology has worked with to, to increase redundancy and to increase robustness. So that, that's a, um, a feedback, okay? So we begin with the idea that if you don't have navigable spaces, you cannot have evolution by natural selection. Mm. And then you have lots of different mechanisms. That's a very simple one of genotype to phenotype. But I can, of course, biology can work and evolution can work with other mechanisms that you can put on top of that. They are possible, so they eventually occur and they are used by natural selection. And one of those is the use of, different, of a number of levels between genotype and organism. Mm, thank you. So, yeah, and to, to wrap up, then everything that I'm saying here can be extended to uh, any sensible and functional definition of phenotype. Okay. Good. So let's go back to RNA. We have these differences in the robustness in different regions of the network. And uh, I'll give you an, uh, a natural example, an empirical example of micro RNAs, right? Of what we were talking about. Uh, this is a functional micro RNA here at the center. This is a secondary structure it has, and this is a natural one. So this is the sequence of a natural micro RNA. When one studies the uh, neighborhood at distance one of this uh, micro RNA, it turns out that mutations affect very little the structure because the position where this uh, sequence is sitting is quite central, is quite near the core. Probably evolution has selected this position where it is robust and where uh, mutations affect very little. It's secondary structure, therefore it's function. All these mutants here, they are ordered, the mutants according to the distance to the secondary structure. So these are sequences and all these sequences are neutral. You have a high fraction of neutral sequences. Non-neutral neighbors still are not that far away. For instance, this is a neighbor at the distance one from the original one. You see here another wobble loop, right? This difference is small. Maybe the function is maintained. This I don't know. But the farther you can go away in the one mutant neighborhood is this, uh, uh, this microRNA at distance 12. So still quite close to the original one. Now do it with a random sequence. You use an inverse folding program. You give uh, the, the structure that you want to get and the program returns a number of sequences compatible with this structure. Take one of these uh, sequences that the, the program has returned and then do the same exercise. Calculate the neighborhood, uh, the structure of the neighborhood, a distance one. And you see that the fraction of neutral 
neighbors is much smaller. And also some mutations largely affect the secondary structure. So it, it in particular, it loses the rod-like structure and has some branched structures very early, right? So, so here you st 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 still, this neighborhood is very bad because mutations here are very disruptive to the secondary structure. So this is a, 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 a case where it could be demonstrated that you have this evolution of genetic robustness in microRNAs by comparing with other regions of the network. One cannot be exhaustive about that, but this is a region which obviously is much more robust than that corresponding to another uh, sequence far away in, in, in my network, right? Okay, so um, this was for independent uh, phenotypes up to now. I've been telling you a few facts about what happens with uh, specific phenotypes, specific secondary structures. But we were interested in knowing what happens when you uh, consider all phenotypes in, in, uh, in a given space. As I was saying, uh, exhaustive enumeration is uh, not achievable over length 22 or something like that. And this is an example that we worked out also some years ago, which is a very small space of length 12. Still, it has almost 17 million sequences that you have to fold. When you do that, um, you have 57 different neutral networks with 44,000 sequence per structure on average, which are not that small networks. You see how far we are from, from reaching uh, realistic biological spaces. And it, this has one particular property, which is that 85% of the sequences do not fold, meaning that most of them, so the, 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 there are no way of getting an energy below zero, which is the energy of the unfolded state, of the open state, the open sequence, right? Uh, because of that, some of the results cannot be extrapolated to uh, longer sequences. What we got here in particular, and this is an example for, uh, for one of the phenotypes, were that uh, genotype networks were typically disconnected and formed uh, by a number of isolated components, right? So you could not move continuously from um, one uh, network to another. If only because, and uh, back to the question of the, two, two of the mutation in, in the pairs, some um, some um, changes you cannot make just uh, incorporating point mutations, right? You cannot move from GC to CG pairs without uh, taking into account two point mutations. So these networks are typically broken just because the symmetry arguments, but if you go to sufficiently long sequences, there is one dominating uh, network that tends to be most of, of uh, of the set of compatible sequences, right? But in this case, no. In this case, our uh, our networks were broken uh, into into pieces, into these smaller components, right? One of the first things that we did was to calculate the size distribution of these broken components as an idea, uh, so to get an idea of of how the space was fragmented. This is what I'm showing here, right? This is a rank ordering of, of, uh, of the structures and uh, they have been colored according to whether they have just one a pair, two pairs, three pairs or four pairs. These are some examples of these different cases, right? So uh, the most abundant ones are those with two pairs. Um, this is a combination of stability and mutations you can do. Yeah, is there a question? If someone is asking, I cannot understand. I think it's a mistake and I'm unmuted. We'll okay. try to mute them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is what we get in this. As you see, this is an exponential rank ordering uh, distribution, which would yield an exponential also distribution of sizes approximately, right? So um, this fragmentation of the space already reminded us of what happens with percolation. If you are below the percolation threshold, 
the sizes that you have in the, the, the uh, clusters that are formed is exponential. This distribution is exponential. And you need to go close to the uh, percolation threshold or above the exponential threshold to get this super component or a different distribution that usually changes to power law uh, when you are close to the threshold, right? So the fact that there were this 85% of uh, sequences not folding and this distribution was indicating that uh, we were not at the point that uh, could uh, tell us which are the characteristic and robust features of this space breaking in, in larger sequences, right? Anyway, this was a study that we conducted. We also calculated how the uh, distribution of the degree distribution changed with the size of the network. Here you have, there was a huge variation depending on the secondary structure, depending on the phenotype. You, ca you have here from the few hundreds to the 50,000 um, so sequences for the different networks. And you see that there was a change in the degree distribution that we could not fit to any reasonable uh, function, of course, as you see, right? But we found something interesting in this study. And it was the fact that as the size, this capital N of the network increased, the average degree of the network seemed to increase with the logarithm of the size. And that, that was interesting because uh, this seemed to be quite nice, th this function and quite well-defined. Uh, so we thought, okay, can we get some uh, analytical argument for this dependence? And we did. Uh, so by studying this uh, small space, which as I was saying, is not still representative of what happens for longer sequences, we could deri so derive this result analytically, which is to first order the average degree, this meaning the average number of neutral neighbors a sequence has, if the network has size capital N, grows like the logarithm of this N. So the larger the network, the larger also its average degree, the more neutral it is, right? And what you see here is uh, we could also analytically estimate these bounds, these red lines. So it forms a, a cone um, with precisely this slope logarithm of n. And this AS is a quantity that depends on the phenotype. And this gives you the upper and lower bounds to these points and you see how uh, so so the, the, the networks fall nicely within the, the region of definition. And this, we know that this is a result that holds for any length of sequences. And remarkably, it has been also observed this dependency in several other models. So this seems to be a property and a, a quasi universal say property of how genotype map onto phenotypes and how genotype spaces fragment under the mapping. We also studied the clustering and well, we had uh, uh, often observed a decay with the average degree, although you see that, uh, so the, the, the X axis is not that large. So, well, I, I take these results with a grain of salt. Um, but if you compare the results to randomized networks, you see that uh, they are not uh, random networks at all. So you have, of course, this increased clustering that is due to these correlations between essentially the mutations that you can accept, the energy of the folded state, and the energy is also deeply related to the secondary structure that you have. Right. Okay, these were results to assortativity. And again, this is reflecting this idea of correlation between stability and mutations that you accept, right? So the number of uh, neighbors of my neighbors since the number of mutations that can be accepted is related to the composition of the sequence. And if you move just one position, the composition is very similar in, for, for a given node and its neighbors. Then you have this positive correlation between um, uh, so uh, low degree nodes and the degree of the neighbors and the other way around, high degree nodes and high degree of neighbors. So you have that these uh, genotype networks for RNA are assortative due to this correlation, right? Okay, still, I was showing this picture of this exponential distribution and later some other people 
calculated was, was the distribution of genotype sizes for a slightly longer RNA, which was an RNA of length 20, right? They exhaustively folded also this space of length 20, and they got this distribution of the sizes of phenotypes. This meaning how many phenotypes have this number of sequences giving rise to the phenotype, right? Again, this is folded using thermodynamics. And uh, you can see here that in base 10, there are 10 orders of magnitude difference between large phenotypes and small phenotypes. And typical phenotypes are also five order of magnitude away from the most abundant ones. This means that most of the sequences fold into a small number of very abundant phenotypes. If you pick sequences at random, what you are going to see mostly are phenotypes that are very abundant. And if you do it at random, these phenotypes will be never observed, right? Unless you do these, you do these exhaust, exhaustive enumerations. This is interesting because um, this observation of some abundant phenotypes and not the, the rare phenotypes is something that nature has incorporated. Well, has incorporated, no, it didn't have another way of, of working. This is a case where uh, some people studied the sizes of, uh, of phenotypes of secondary structures that are found in nature. You see here, these big uh, circles are biological structures. So these people here, so with Andreas Wagner, uh, coordinating the study, devised a way to calculate the size of these uh, of the networks. You see here the size that these networks would have, right? So they are extremely large, right? And um, so they took sequences that exist, the structures that exist, and computationally could estimate the uh, approximate number of sequences that would fold into that secondary structure. And what they saw is that you only see the rightmost part of the distribution. They were not aware of that at the time. They thought this was the distribution, but they, by sampling, randomly sampling other uh, structures, they saw that biological structures tended to be on the, uh, so, so belong to very large phenotypes, right? And smaller phenotypes were not that often observed in nature. This was the first observation, which was interesting. This was the title of their paper. Biological RNA molecules have a typically large genotype network, a typically uh, meant from a statistical viewpoint, right? That, uh, to the fact that many phenotypes do not have that large secondary structures. But you, if you think in evolutionary terms, what it means is that when you have a sequence uh, drifting in the space of sequences, with a higher probability, with the highest probability, it will encounter phenotypes that are common, not phenotypes that are rare, because there are so many orders of magnitude in, in difference in the abundance of abundant versus typical or sl small, right? So this is what they were finding. And this is a later study when, where this was repeated with uh, all RNA non-coding sequences of length 100, right? And you see that sequences, structures that are observed in nature nicely fall into this uh, rightmost part of the distribution. Because these, these colleagues, uh, Art Louis and, and co-workers, they um, fitted the data for increasingly large sequences. And they found out that it was compatible with a log normal distribution. So there, they concluded that nature was only observing the very large phenotypes. And there was a bunch of other phenotypes as they had seen in length 20 that are never observed by nature because they are never found through random mutation, right? So they, this was their conclusion. And actually uh, slightly later, we could demonstrate indeed that for RNA, the distribution of, of uh, phenotype sizes has to be a log normal. We could calculate the distribution explicitly with a model mapping um, uh, this variation per site and using combinatorics to estimate the number of different uh, se secondary structures you have with the same number of pairs and using a two uh, values approximation 
for the number of neutral mutations in unpaired positions and in pair positions. And uh, well, actually you can do the math, it's not trivial. So it took us some time to, to find this out, but you can demonstrate that this is exactly the function that fits and that this is indeed a log normal distribution of phenotype sizes. That was also interesting because this immediately allows you to estimate um, the, the sizes through the procedure we developed for uh, any RNA secondary structure. So I can give you an estimate of the size of the, of the network just by looking at the sequence and using our uh, approximation, our two levels approximation, right? Important here, the huge difference in orders of magnitude, just length 100, you see it goes from 21 to 42 orders of magnitude. And what nature sees is only this rightmost part, only the large phenotypes are seen through evolution. This means if I go back to that metaphor of the, uh, of the landscape and of reaching the peak of landscapes, it might be, I cannot discard that some phenotypes that are rare, not that abundant, are much better in performing functions than the phenotypes that I find here. But this is a very strong entropic effect. I cannot find those phenotypes. Therefore, even if I sit on top of those, I lose them through mutation and I move to the very abundant phenotypes. That's an entropic trapping. And um, so this is what we observe in, na in nature and, and what one could expect with these very large numbers, okay. So also these differences in abundance turns into uh, structures. These are, these are um, rough coarse grained uh, secondary RNA structures, some that are observed and some that are not observed in nature. So there are only a small subset of all possible motifs that are observed. And uh, my take is that they are not going to be observed because they probably correspond to small networks and they are rare. So even if, if sometimes we force synthetically to, to design uh, a, a new RNA or a new protein with specific properties, the fact that you have uh, such, that, that they are low entropy solutions uh, probably make them unstable and they will fall, so leave this solution and go to more abundant phenotypes, right? Okay, so these are other considerations about um, how the composition also on the structures or biases uh, molecules towards abundant phenotypes also, again. So th there were some previous evidence and actually it was in the last five years that we have uh, finally learned uh, how these phenotypes distribute the sizes and uh, better understood the reasons why they are not there. Okay, I was saying there are many more maps. Um, there are these that I'm showing here, these are many to one uh, genotype phenotype maps. This was for RNA. This was the one that I mentioned about uh, proteins, the HP model where you fold on a lattice, but you can do some other more complex stuff like for regulatory networks and metabolism. You have, uh, so reactions can be your genotype and uh, what uh, comes out of the reactions can be your phenotype. We have this multi-level uh, system where we use the HP model, but we're putting some other uh, layers on top and we recovered robustness. Um, and uh, some other people have worked with protein quaternary structures and many other, uh, I don't know if many other, but several other models. The point is that when you study genotype phenotype maps, uh, distribution of sizes of phenotypes in particular, in all these different models, you get the same consistently, you get the same results. So this is, um, uh, so these distributions are highly biased when you use this rank ordering, you get these fat tailed distributions that look very similar in many different cases, right? This is uh, again for RNA, this was for one length, this is for a different number of lengths. This is for protein quaternary structure uh, in different instances of how you define the phenotype. And you see that once and again, and this is for three-dimensional HP model, and you get these distributions, which in all cases that we have studied are compatible with log normal distributions of, of sizes of phenotypes, right? So this seems to be a quasi-universal um, property. 
I believe it's universal if uh, maps have to be navigable. There are some exceptions, for instance, in two letters RNA, the space is not navigable. And this might be one reason that we don't have RNA with only two letters, right? So we need four because otherwise it's not uh, evolvable in, a, in, in the sense I've been discussing, right? So this also entails some implications for evolution. And this has been discussed in a number of papers that I just put here for uh, just to emphasize these ideas. So this, you have this variation in phenotypic abundance that critically influences evolutionary dynamics. Naturally occurring RNA molecules are biased towards abundant phenotypes and evolution yields abundant phenotypes, this idea I discussed it, even when they are not the most fit. Why? Because fitness is uh, not only a function of a specific sequence, contrary to Salisbury arguments, but it's a combination of robustness, of an entropy in the sense of uh, the generation of redundancy, and uh, also function, right? Also, uh, so performance, chemical performance. Again, the arrival of the frequent. So it's not only the fittest, it's not uh, the abundance, the, the um, what was that? Yeah, so it, it's not the fitter, it's the frequent, right? It's uh, frequent phenotypes can fix in a population even when alternative, but less frequent phenotypes with much higher fitness are potentially accessible. They are lost. Even if you sit on top of those phenotypes, if you design those phenotypes through mutations, you lose that function if it's not abundant. Again, this was a case for a multi-layer uh, genotype phenotype map. And uh, it turns out that not all gene regulatory networks are equally likely because at the lower levels, they have different degrees of um, redundancy, right? Again, you find the most common and we observe it also in this model, the, the, the fixation of uh, the fetus phenotype is prevented just because it's not abundant. So again, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I finished the, the discussion about this uh, fitness landscape, the classical landscape with mountains, hills and valleys, right? So now mountains, peaks of mountains are those optimal phenotypes, but you cannot reach those optimal phenotypes if they are not abundance. Abundance is not included in, in this uh, view of evolution on landscapes, right? And you can never reach the peak even if it exists. Right, so this is this is one of the of the conclusions of our study of networks. So when we visualize these spaces, we have a network. This is the network for a length uh, twelve. Although I have illustrated it with different phenotypes, but here you have some of them are very abundant. So size of the node now is proportional to abundance of the phenotype, and you see that they are essentially all of them connected to each other, and especially to what regards abundant phenotypes, those in the outer circle, right? So they are all connected to each other and the smaller ones maybe are not globally connected, but also connected to many others, but these are irrelevant to evolution because they are difficult to find. And this situation is more and more critical as the length of the sequences increases, right? So the differences are become larger and the effect of course is, is more uh, notable. So this would be a much better representation of what, um, changes between phenotypes uh, mean when you do evolution. You have different sizes corresponding to the number of genotypes that give you a given phenotype, and you have possibility to jump to any other phenotype essentially, but not with the same probability. So these are not symmetrical uh, networks when we talk of, uh, of, of mutating, uh, so of, of a, a going to different phenotypes. So it might be, relatively difficult to go to this red phenotype because it's it's rare. And when I move in my net, network corresponding to the green phenotype, there are very few positions where I can access this uh, red phenotype, even if it is fitter, while the other way around, maybe the green network is embracing lots of the uh, sequences of the red phenotype. And then it's much easier to jump from red to green, right? So there is a sort of direction of preference of fluxes when you have evolution on phenotypes, it's not, everything is not equally likely. And you have these trappings that lead you, of course, if you have a lower fitness and uh, your phenotype is small, there's nothing to do. You, you will be jumping from there to abundant phenotypes, but there is this compromise between fitness and size. 
right? This is something that we are working out and uh, hope to have some analytical results soon to show how the two quantities depend on each other and combine. There was also a question previously on, on, uh, on plasticity, right? What I've been talking here, and again, just coming back to a bigger picture that we don't want to lose uh, in our heads, is the fact that these genotype-phenotype maps are never uh, many to one. There are many to many, and that's important. Every sequence can give rise to different secondary structures. And this is so for any map that you can imagine. Why? Because of something that I think that we discussed yesterday also, you have finite temperature and you have uh, pairs that form and uh, open uh, along evolution. And in principle, you have a whole distribution of different structures that are visited by each sequence through time, right? Uh, so there have been some, um, formal treatment also of this situation with partition functions, where the energy of each configuration is directly the energy that you see in your partition function. And you can calculate then the time that at the given temperature you will spend in each configuration. But essentially, it's not only that you have this flat map, but you also have different possibilities that might depend on the environment. So the environment might force you to fold into a different uh, phenotype. And this, uh, so it's related to the ideas of phenotypic plasticity, of protein moonlighting. And you also have that without need of changing the environment, just because uh, you fluctuate, you can have this RNA promiscuity, enzyme promiscuity, and also something slightly different but related, which is molecular mimicry. So one of the molecules could disguise it in, in another molecule just because it's taking the configuration of a different one, right? This uh, time permitting, we will see this tomorrow when we talk about uh, viroids, which have a rod-like structure, but are formed by RNA, but they have adapted their uh, properties so as to be disguised as DNA, right? So they are uh, replicating, so the replicating machinery takes them for, for DNA. Yeah? They, are, they are mimicking the, the properties of DNA. So this is also important, of course. It's very important in adaptation because we know that uh, so partial function can be present just because you have this plasticity of the genotype to phenotype map of this many-to-many -many association, right? There, are, these are just some uh, some uh, examples of what happens uh, when you are traveling your networks and then you have you are changing you know, the potential for evolution, how RNA can play different roles, uh, just the same molecule um, in different situations, right? And also this idea of promiscuous protein functions, meaning that I can have a given sequence performing a primary function, but there might be secondary functions that are also important or that are also potentially there. And when the right selective pressure appears, this uh, molecule can perform both functions and can this second function can be can evolve to 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 be to improve and to better suit what uh, what the need was at that moment right so that's a bit a bit uh, side uh, ideas but i don't want to keep uh, so loose focus on these possibilities so we believe that this is a better representation of what an adaptive scape is, adaptive multiscapes. This is something that we proposed in 2017. And here you have this representation of my genotype networks as uh, large blobs. Um, we can't do it much better, actually. It's still far from what reality uh, is, but uh, high dimensional spaces are difficult to represent, right? And in a given environment, this is environment one, you have these transitions between phenotypes that would be depending on fitness, on performance, and also on, on size of the phenotypes. When you go to a different uh, environment, first thing, your genotypes map onto different phenotypes, probably the expression of the phenotype changes. And you can also have this uh, promiscuity in function that allows you even so same phenotypes in the first environment perform differently with a different fitness, but to be not completely useless. So this is this can already trigger the evolution when an environment changes. This, I mean, the whole picture for me, uh, what conveys is extreme robustness 
on of, uh, of populations and on, of, of evolutionary systems, right? So there are so many possibilities that you can explore at the molecular level, not to be stuck to avoid extinction, right? And this is a power of, of the mechanism that through ages, uh, selection has been incorporating, uh, so natural selection has been incorporating in the repertoire of tools, right? So definitely this is not a suitable representation of population evolution. I think that if you change your metaphors by something based on networks and on layers, you will, you will much better interpret uh, future experiments. This has been my case repeatedly with people working with viruses that using this representation could not make sense of what they were seeing in the lab. And if you change your representation, immediately you change your framework and you can uh, so give different viewpoints to, to, what, uh, to what experimentally might be happening, right? Okay, that was, that was the first part. On topology, and my second part for today's lesson that I'm afraid will be extended into tomorrow, will be extending into tomorrow, uh, is about the dynamics on genotype networks. So now we have the networks. How can we uh, work and uh, find some properties of my populations evolving on these networks? If I take again this picture, I have different kinds of, or, or I can separate the, the, tip, the dynamics that I will be observing, right? First, I have evolution on neutral networks, which is uh, this change, this drift in the neutral, uh, among the neutral possibilities, right? I can have adaptive evolution through mutation, and this will be represented through jumps in different, uh, to a different phenotype, possible pathways or regions where these two networks uh, are near. And I can have also responses to environmental changes that can proceed in different ways. My phenotypes might be changed. I can have secondary uh, functions that are co-opted in the new environment. And when I go to the new environment, and again, I can have uh, adaptation through mutation and evolution on neutral networks, right? This is a very simple form of framework where we can study how this evolution proceeds. So this matrix here, M, contains all the information about the fitness of my sequences and the topology of my space, right? It has, here I have shown uh, two terms. This is the transfer matrix where I have uh, first a matrix of fitness, which is E. If I know the value in a given environment of each of the sequences, this is related to the replication rate of this sequence in that, uh, a specific environment. This goes to my matrix E, which is a, a di diagonal in this case, because this is telling me about the reproductive speed or the, the relative reproduction rate of each of my sequences. Then C here is the adjacency matrix. I can study my evolution on a neutral network, for instance, if I am in a neutral network, then E is a constant because all sequences have the same value. And here, my matrix C is simply describing, describing uh, links between sequences that are on the neutral network, right? Okay, so then N of T is a vector that uh, tells me for each of the nodes that I'm studying, which is the abundance, the number of sequences sitting on that node at a given time. And I have an initial condition where I start, which, uh, will be given by uh, the, the preparation of my system can be different can be different states yes pratyush could you please go over the um, meaning of e and c matrices once again uh, i think i couldn't follow very well yeah okay let me see if i have something else here ah uh, okay e is a matrix of uh, reproduction rates so you see it's multiplied by a diagonal matrix. That's the identity matrix, right? So in E, I put just the, uh, it, it's a sort of the classical understanding of fitness where it's uh, essentially how fast the sequence replicates. If I have two sequences and one is fitter than the other, take for instance, the case of quasi species, then I have a master sequence, which might have a, a replicating ability of two and the other has a replicating ability of one for instance. So this is my matrix E that is just diagonal because what matters is this product is 
two for the first sequence, one for the second sequence. This is just replicative ability, right? And this is um, and this is the adjacency matrix. This is the topological matrix. It's just one or zero depending on whether two nodes are linked or not. This is the classical adjacency matrix, very often named A uh, when you work with networks, right? So here I have something that has to do with uh, being in a fitness landscape and something that has to do with the topology of this landscape. In the specific case where uh, I'm in a neutral network, I don't have a landscape, so my landscape is flat or all sequences have the same value. E is a constant, all values of E are equal. And then I can get rid of E and I'm left with E and C. So the dynamics are dominated by the topology on neutral networks. And if I have a landscape, a fitness landscape, I have to include this matrix telling me what's the value of each sequence in the specific environment I'm studying, right? So um, this depends on, on the problem that, you, that you're working with, but I, I, I would like just to keep in mind that this is, this is quite simple to work with. You have a matrix that multiply by a vector, which is the vector of uh, abundances in each node when you begin your iterations, and then you just go on multiplying and then you get how the population moves on the network. I'll give you some specific examples a bit later, right? So, uh, so I'm supposing you're familiar with that because you're a physicist, but this might not be the case and I apologize if it is not. So uh, you can develop this, uh, these dynamics in terms of the eigenvalues of the matrix M. These are lambda one, lambda two, lambda M. This has M eigenvalues, which is the dimension of the matrix to the power of T. And these uh, coefficients here are just the projections of the initial condition you had on the eigenvectors of the matrix M, right? So, so you have your matrix M, you calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and you have lots of information about how the dynamics of your system will proceed. In particular, for infinite time, since this is dominated by the largest eigenvalue, you can get rid of all the rest of the equation. And you know that the stationary state will be the largest eigenvector of the matrix, this U1, right? This U1 is what is classically called mutation selection equilibrium, right? And in finite time, you iterate on your network and you get to this stationary state. You can have different initial conditions. So each node can contain a specified initial number of sequences. You can imagine that if you have prepared the system with random sequences, then you have equal abundances in each node. Or you can imagine that you are jumping to a new phenotype. And then you say, no, I'm jumping through the periphery. And I have just a small population if in just one of those periphery nodes. This affects the dynamic, the, the progression of so the evolution, the transients, essentially the time it takes you to reach to, to get the, the uh, mutation selection equilibrium, but uh, does not affect it, right? Just the transient. So the dynamics are also simple and here describe it. Each time step at each generation, and this in this case, in this description, uh, you have a substitution of the of uh, at the generation of the individuals in the previous generation. You could keep them as well by changing uh, the quantities you have <coughs> by adding the individuals in the previous step at each of the nodes. But this is substitution. So uh, in this specific case, the population of a node duplicates or produces R copies. R would be the quantity that you specify in this matrix E, and then you have mutations. This means that at each node, you have this replication, and then you have sort of diffusion to neighbors due to this probability mu. And the other way around, you have your neighbors replicating at a given rate and giving population also to the central node with this uh, probability mu. Uh, well, th these are some of the properties of these uh, dynamics. If uh, your E is constant, that is, if you're moving on a neutral network, the, then the eigenvalues of your adjacency matrix already tell you about the eigenvalues of uh, the matrix M, of the transition matrix, because it's just, uh, you just need to add this quantity here. The eigenvalues of E, of, of C, are those here, right? So, uh, and the eigenvalues of M have an additional factor. Anyway, I mean, um, 
you can go into the details. It's written in different papers. In particular, we do we did specific development for networks of genotypes in this paper here in Physical Review E. So you can check there the math if, if you're interested in that. Okay, uh, one of the important results of the nice results that we got is that the time to equilibrium is inversely proportional to the mutation rate. And of course, it depends on the initial condition. If you are close or far from your final state, these alphas here, which are the projections on the eigenvectors, then it can take longer or shorter to, so, sorry, to, to attain the stationary state, right? And you have this inverse dependence with the mutation rate. Okay, so these are some numerical examples, for instance, of the time to equilibrium in a, uh, this is a random network with these uh, properties of rep replication of, of the sequences and uh, mutation. This was for a neutral network for different values of the mutation rate. You see how the slope changes as predicted as one over mu and the time to equilibrium depending on mu also uh, so changes as, as, as uh, as expected, right? So, uh, well, these are some calculations that you can make. And uh, these are uh, other numerical simulations that were produced early uh, at the beginning of such of these studies, of this kind of studies. This was 1999. Um, and what you see here is when starting with different initial conditions, you eventually go to this stationary state, which in the case of network is defined by a quantity which is the, the, the sort of the dispersion of my population in the network. You, if you know about the, the adjacency matrix of the network, the C in the previous slide, then you calculate analytically this, uh, this distribution of the population, this overall distribution, and you see that if it eventually converges to this distribution, to this quantity, right, my population, but it takes longer or shorter depending on how I have prepared my population at the beginning, depending on the initial condition. And this is another nice result that one has to keep in mind, which is that if you don't have sufficiently large populations or you don't have sufficiently high mutation rates, you might be stuck locally and unable to progress to this uh, final equilibrium that corresponds to uh, infinite populations. The important quantity here is the product population size. This was called M here, times the mutation rate. So it should be above, around above one for uh, the dynamics to really converge to the, to, the, to the final state of infinite populations. Otherwise you get your population stuck at other positions, right? You see here, this final D, so the, the, the final value of, of the dispersion of the population, the location of the population on the network for different values of this product. And you see that there is a transition when the product is large enough, uh, in this case, essentially going uh, well above 10, right? So depending on the population. So since you're exploring your space through mutation, you need an enough push, enough push if you are a few individuals to go to other uh, positions. Otherwise, replication keeps you stuck, uh, pin it in, in specific local uh, regions of your networks, right? So this, uh, the conclusion is you can only evolve robustness. So going to these highly connected regions of the network, if the product population size mutation rate is high enough, right? So when this occurs, when this product is uh, sufficiently large, we see a phenomenon of trapping in uh, highly connected regions. Uh, this is first an old result that uh, showed that the pop population of sequences tends to occupy the areas of maximal connectivity of the neutral networks. And the robustness to mutation increases along neutral evolution. This means that even if you sit in a single phenotype and you don't see changes in the phenotype, if you are incorporating neutral mutations, which is a natural consequence of evolution, and it's just an expression of the molecular clock, you are progressing towards regions which are more robust. And this impl implies that because networks are assortative, these genotype networks are assortative, actually the molecular clock accelerates as evolution proceeds. If you don't change your phenotype again, and you have this trend demonstrated, to go to, to the core of the network, to highly connected regions, it happens. 
that um, you tick faster as you go closer because there are more solutions to keep neutral. So more neutral net neighbors as you uh, as evolution proceeds, right? So this is an effect that uh, we have seen computationally and that I believe should be keep in, kept in mind also when uh, one uses the molecular clock to calibrate branches in, in phylogenetic trees because shorter branches have a much slower ticking than very long branches, right? On top of the fact that uh, as, as it is known, different uh, positions have different uh, ticking rates. Right, but there is also this acceleration, which depends on the time that you have spent in a given phenotype. Somewhere there? Yeah, I don't see any question, I think. Um, okay, so I think let's continue tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, we have a talk at 6.30 by David Nelson. So we'll join at 6.30. Bye, Susanna. Okay. Okay. Thank you and see you tomorrow. Thank you.